I'm calling to order the Education Committee meeting for uh, this morning, uh, and I will ask uh, Mr. Garvin if you would lead us in prayer. Okay, would you please stand? <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we thank you especially for this time we can meet together to do business with the Cherokees. We ask now that you bless each of us and bless the ones that present this morning. We thank you for your love and your watch care. I especially want to pray for our service people, pray for their safety, pray for their soon return to their levels. Forgive us for our sins in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Our, our roll call vote today, then, if you, uh, we would ask that you signify your desire to serve on this committee uh, by an affirmation on, uh, during the roll call. Joe Anglin? Yes, yes. Mel John Baker? Here, yes. Jack Baker? Here, yes. Connor Glory Jordan? Prison? Yes. Joe Crittenden? Yes, yes. Meredith Fraley? Brad Cobb? Yes, here and yes. <laughs> Chris Soap? Honey, yes. Jody Fishing Hawk? Here, yes. David Thornton? <clears throat> yes. Carol Cowan Watts? Honey, yes. Julia, Janelle Fulbright? Here, yes. Meredith Fraley? Here. You want to be on this committee? Madam Chair, would it be possible I could get on this committee? I'm getting to you. You think one of you that before I got to the committee. You want to be on the committee? Oh, yes. <laughs> Don Garvin. Honey, yes. Come on. I'm here. I'm here. Oh. Harvey, but I'm Hoskin, Jr. Here, yes. Okay. Okay. Curtis now. Okay, Curtis now. Here, here, here. Yes. Okay. Uh, I would at this time then entertain uh, a motion to approve the minutes from the July 17th regular session. <laughs> okay. Moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor. Um, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Carried unanimously. Madam Chairman, at this time, uh, at your request, I'd like to amend the agenda to have a new uh, business item of uh, uh, suggestions for meeting schedules, which should be in front of everybody uh, for action. And uh, make that one, uh, number one of new business. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Uh, we will amend the agenda and uh, place the item under new business. Would that be <coughs> okay? And we will now hear reports, first of all, from Talking Leads Job Corps and Diane Kelly. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, I think they always put talking leads on there, but it's really the vocational components of our okay. services. All right. Uh, we always report on that. I've got two people I want to introduce. I was going to introduce them in employment, but since that's been deferred to the 30th? Is it, but is it 30th? I don't know when it is. Yes. 30th. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I've got two uh, new managers that I want to introduce. I'd like to introduce Brenda Fitzgerald, Brenda Fitzgerald, Brenda Krause Fitzgerald. She is the new manager of the uh, Vocational Rehabilitation Program, which is located behind the motel, uh, right next door to the TAG office. They're getting ready to move around the corner over by where natural resources are. But Brenda uh, has been on board for about three weeks, and I want to introduce her to you. 
Next is Mr. Jonathan Overacker. He is the new manager of job development, which is the tarot office. He is the interim director right now filling in for Ed Big Horse. And uh, Jonathan uh, uh, has been on board for about <coughs> three weeks, <coughs> two weeks. And has he got his feet wet? <laughs> but uh, anyway, I want to introduce those two man managers to you. Um, Talking Leaves is getting ready to go through a uh, last leg of their five-year contract. Uh, we have what we call option years, and we're getting ready to go through a Department of Labor review. Uh, it'll be in September. And then they come back and say whether or not they designate or whether they have us to come in, but we have to do a new five-year plan. We do this every five years. It's, a, it's an annual plan we've been doing since 1978. And uh, we will be uh, having a graduation over the center in October. I'll send you all invitations for that. Uh, our vocational training program, I think some of you all have already been in contact with us about people that are wanting to go to school this fall. Uh, our monies does not actually uh, come into effect until October 1. So uh, some of those people that are coming in right now, I know school has already actually started for some of those. And basically what we're going to have to do is to work with the school system like we would if it's if it's a four-year program like the uh, Pell. So if you get any calls, we, uh, feel free to get in touch with us because we can't actually start spending money until October because of the fiscal year. Do you all have any questions? Thank you. No questions? Thank you. Uh, I'm be quick. <laughs> <laughs> Next we have the Executive Director's Report, Dr. Neil Morton. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> this is your busiest week. It's our busiest week. Uh, immersion started this week. Head Start started this week. Sequoia started this week. And everyone's scurrying. And higher ed started this week. So all the scholarship kids are, are out. And so uh, I do have uh, with me this morning and will be with me every time that I that I meet with you because uh, they're my resources. So when you ask me a question, a lot of times I'll simply relay it to Nita Wilson, who is uh, program manager, or to Jennifer Pigeon, who is director of uh, the money, director of the financial affairs in the College of Education. And of course, back here we have uh, Laura Sly from Cultural Resources and Verna Thompson from uh, Head Start. To give you a, uh, a brief overview, I, I did yesterday, so if you have some questions uh, pertaining to that, I'd be happy to answer them. Among your constituents, uh, get prepared for lots of calls concerning uh, areas in education, primarily in the area of the uh, scholarship program, because that is one that you'll get, get calls on. Uh, our scholarship program um, has increased as a result of action taken uh, by this committee to include um, a $1,000 per semester, $1,000 per semester scholarship for all students, whether they be Pell students, meaning that they qualify for special uh, funding through the federal government, or Cherokee Nation students who are not not <coughs> eligible or graduate students. Your most uh, the phone calls that you will be receiving first will be from graduate students who are on the waiting list. All students who had a complete application and qualified for both PAL and non PAL were funded and received notification uh, last week. And so the money is already on, on the way to their college, the college of their choice. We have 47 students who are graduate students that are on a waiting list. That does not mean that they will not be funded. In all likelihood, they will be funded by second semester. Because uh, on the 22nd of this month, we require that the students <coughs> notify us that uh, that they are in fact in school uh, and that otherwise we ask the money be returned from the school of their choice and we put that back in the pot and then we fund graduate students now the the priority of funding of course is is established by this <coughs> it's undergraduate 
and then graduate. Uh, you know, with the rationale that uh, the graduate student has already been helped to a certain extent, uh, and we need to get as many of the undergraduate students through a backdoor program as possible. So continuing students funded first, then new students undergraduate, and then graduate students are funded uh, last. There's also usually a little confusion about residency. We do fund uh, Pell students, uh, of course, worldwide. We had uh, some in from uh, Indonesia uh, last week. Uh, so they're, they're funded worldwide. Now, those that are non pell we have a 14-county area and a contiguous area that we fund, which includes uh, three counties in Arkansas, uh, Washington, Crawford, uh, yeah, and Ben. There we go. And then uh, Missouri, um, uh, McDonald, and LeBet, and Cherokee, and one other in Kansas, right? Just LeBet and Cherokee in, in Kansas for, for the uh, non pale for the regular students. Um, so you will probably be receiving some calls from, from graduate students who are not funded or perhaps from a student that did not have a complete uh, survey, did not have a complete application. But everyone who had a complete application and met the guidelines, which uh, you know, established by this committee, except for 47 graduate students were So, uh, Mr. Thornton, you had a question? Yeah, Dr. Moore? Yes, sir. Uh, the graduate didn't get their application in on time, that's who you was just talking about. And they have received the $500 emergency. <clears throat> Come next semester, the people that have dropped out of the program, will they be eligible for their scholarships? They would be be eligible for, in other words, if a student drops out of a program, will that money still be eligible uh, for reallocation? Right. Yes. Okay. Then they need to fill out an application for the next semester. Then. Right. In other words, if we did not fund them and they got five hundred dollar scholarship, mm -hmm. then if funds were available for second semester to pick them up regular then they could be picked up. But they need to fill out an application for them. No, actually they would not need a new form, would they? They just need to update us. So they would need to complete their regular high rate application also. That way it'd be on file for the people from the waiting list. Yeah. But if they already have one on on file. <coughs> They would have been yeah. yeah, they would need. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just for your records, uh, to show the distribution, uh, on the front page it shows the number of pale, non pale graduate, and those in waiting. And on the back page it will show. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, now I am confused. Because I thought if they didn't get their application completed by a certain deadline, that they were pretty much out of luck for the entire year. Yeah, if they if they did not make the deadline, they're they are out, right? And, and I, I think that's what David was asking, but. Now, I, I understood. I understood uh, Mr. Thornton's question to be if they were denied the first time well, around and got a $500 emergency so they could get started. Huh. If funds became available, well, but they weren't denied because we didn't have funds, were they? I'm they, sorry. They were denied because they were denied because they didn't get their application in. No, they see they're they're not really denied. They're on that waiting list, and and that was my mistake. I used the word denied. There are, at this point, no one has been denied who has a complete application. Okay. But those below a GPA of 3.2 uh, are on a waiting list. Okay. But let me help understand that. 
Okay. I think his person did not get their application completed in time. And I, I think he's believing that we can... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, another application and get funded for the second semester. Well, I think that's... told is that uh, we have an emergency. Yeah, we have, we have an... Uh, where these people can receive $500 for this semester. Right. And then what I was wondering is those people can go ahead and apply for the next semester how the funding that's been funded for the students to drop out. No, they're, they're held off until the following cycle. Until the next year. Right. Now, probably we'll be coming back to you uh, depending on availability of funds and uh, suggesting that we might consider uh, a greater level of funding for summer, especially for students who only lack summer to graduate, instead of forcing them to wait and graduate midterm, to let them go ahead and carry a full load in summertime so that they can graduate at the end of summer and be on the job market, especially those that are going into education. Ms. John Watts, can you manage here? It would save us money to do that as well, would it not? Yes. Thank you. Mr. 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 Chair. Uh, Dr. Morton, what, what are we talking about emergency? Can you elaborate what you consider as emergency for educational benefits? Those persons that for, let's say that a person did not get uh, an application in. Let's say for some reason they didn't get an application in or they decided that they were going to college after the deadline passed. And all at once it became possible for them to go to college. And uh, they said, I can make everything except $700. So, well, we'll say, okay, our level of funding for an emergency is five. So we'll make five of that. If you can get the rest of your money, then go ahead and enroll. And usually, usually they do. It's just to help them over the hump. For those persons that thought, yeah, I can go to college now but because of lots of circumstances. You know, maybe they just moved back here. Gives them a little head start. And then they're, see, they're uh, ready to go then on that next funding cycle uh, for us to pick up with the regular $1,000 per semester. This, this, this looked to me like we're opening yourself up or to the education department up to a lot of these emergencies in those cases, although I'm glad we do have those exceptions. So, You know, one would, one would think so, uh, but it, it's rather, I guess this would be a busiest time, and we've signed about five this week. So it, uh, and usually the, um, the circumstances are, are well documented. It's those students that uh, just missed out for for various reasons, and uh, that helps them over the line. The back of that page will show you uh, the out of area students that we're uh, funding. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, Madam which graduates got scholarships and by grade point by grade point average. average. We take the grade point average and we fund it down to three point two eight. Three point two eight. And so they're in they're ranked now in descending order according to GPA. Do, do you fund the uh, um, do you consider a law degree in the same grade point standards as a graduate student of say business? No, we do not. Okay, so is there a different uh, we don't don't have a different a different scale. Now one other thing that I need to explain is that many of these that are on the waiting list uh, won't have to wait until second semester to be funded because as soon as we got our responses after the 22nd of this month, which is of course next week, several students will opt not to go even though they've been funded. So that will put more money back into the uh, into the kitty. 
Now, to further, to, to follow your question further, though, we have uh, another program that we will hopefully be implementing by second semester called Directed Studies. Uh, that is based on hard to fill positions at the Church Nation and funds the full cost of college on a competitive basis for certain uh, uh, areas. The, the, reason I, the reason I ask that question, if you've been through a law school, a law school program versus a regular graduate program, because I've been through both of them, in a regular graduate program, uh, A's and B's are much more prevalent than they're going to be in a law school program. And I, Chuck, I, would you agree on that? Yeah, I mean, I can only speak to the law school experience. And I won't disclose my grades. <laughs> but, uh, but certainly there are the distributions I think are treated differently. And so you, you might have a disparate treatment of a law student you apply the same standard. And of course the same would be true of, uh, of medical students and so forth. Ms. Bradley, do you have a question? I'd like to yield my time to Mr. Evans here. He had, uh, uh, I had asked him how much money we have available. Can you want to take that to yeah, the make a, uh, a quick statement to make sure everyone, all minds are clear and everyone's on the same page. That, that, uh, I understand there's 47 graduate students mm -hmm. had applications in on time but we're not funded due to lack of funding right. for this year. And there's $20.5 million travel discretionary surplus right now. Just want to make everyone understood that those graduates were, were not, their applications were not late or incomplete. They were on time. Right. They, this is a, they were only not, they were, they were not funded only because of lack of reason, lack of funding. Right. Okay. Ms. Fulbright. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, is there any way I know, you know, and that this body could go ahead and appropriate funds to go ahead at this time and fund these additional 47 people. Uh, and I also think that we need to seriously look at considering raising the thousand dollars that's been at that level for many years, ever since it was established, and the cost of education has risen considerably, but also the funding of the, of, that the tribe has accessible to it has also <coughs> increased considerably. I think we need to look at raising it because uh, the tuition and everything has gone up tremendously just in the last three to four years. I don't think we're keeping up with, uh, the way I understand it, basically in the past the Pell students only received enough money from us to raise them up to a thousand dollars and now we're giving them a thousand dollars plus their pail and that was quite a big uh, increase in funding for them and I think we need to look at the non pell and consider raising them and I really think we should try to find a way to fund these 47 people thank you Mr. Hoskins uh, my question was I actually <laughs> let me withdraw that. I do have a question. I don't mean to get us off track back on the emergency because I, I agree with the council statement. But on the emergency funding, if a person sought that, would it be a person, for example, who missed the deadline or, like you say, didn't decide till late to apply, and then they just on their own initiative get the application in, or are we somehow publicizing this? Uh, so I'm on your own, own initiative. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Burgess, it's usually, they usually do not even know that $500 would be available. They come in for counseling on, on higher ed and they've, you know, they weren't here at the time of, uh, of the application. And uh, so it's just a, uh, on a case by case basis. And how is that? Where is that funding setting that we're able to, to have that emergency money when we have 40? And I don't mean to question that. In general, other words, where does that money come it, from? It would come out of the uh, of the regular funding program. So that's the reason that there aren't very many of them. 
Mr. Picker? Uh, one question and one clarification, I think. If, if I'm not mistaken, the grade point average that we qualify these graduate students for, is their undergraduate grade point average? Correct. And we don't go back into law school and say, oh, no, you made a C, so we're not going to give you the money. No, we don't because uh, we do not have uh, a way of weighting the number of hours accomplished. Right. And there'd be so many formulae that we it'd be impossible. But I mean, grade point average is undergraduate. You yeah. qualify, and then we, we stay the Yeah. So... That kind of takes care of medical school and law school. Yeah. Now, this, the question I have is, what level do we fund those graduate students? At what level? Uh -huh. Just the same as we fund the uh, the other students, thousand dollars. So, a hundred thousand dollar appropriation would fund these other forty-seven students, and we would probably consider some carryover money. Yeah. Because all of them wouldn't go, or some of them that we've already funded wouldn't go. Right. And, uh, it, and it would. You know, solve this problem of let's face it; it's fairly static. We're not going to the our only increases next year probably will come from greater awareness of your constituents that Pell is eligible for a thousand dollars rather than three fifty. So it would it would solve the problem of uh, turning anyone away who had a completed application and and qualified. Madam Chairman, uh, see, we're not going to have time to do it, though, are we? Well, okay. I'd make a motion that we put fifty thousand uh, dollars, move it to executive finance, to fund these forty-seven uh, graduate students that are waiting, and then we'll put the rest of the money in uh, in the budget hearings for the second semester. Sure. It's been seconded. Is this just a voice vote? Yes. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Maybe it passes you names. One more. One more question. Actually, we've got an order here. I think, and I do oh. have you on the. One that, clarification. Uh huh. Please. Does that take your indirect cost, or do I need to put more money? <laughs> no, they're not subject to indirect cost. Okay. But if I could add one comment, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, absolutely. There was an appropriation made uh, by the council in 2006 where the education department, the higher education department, was allowed the opportunity to determine an allocation based on non pale undergrad, grad, and VOTEC. That money, a uh, portion of that money carried over into 2007, this fiscal year, and it was uh, uh, funded again, the carryover was funded again. <coughs> Now that particular fund is currently setting, if I'm not mistaken, unencumbered and little in excess of a quarter million dollars. That's already in the 2007 budget. It's just unencumbered right now. Um, and it's sitting in an allocation for non payer But that allocation of non payer was derived by the Higher Education Department in 2006. And this body granted the authorization for Dr. Morton's department to make such allocation. A million was allocated to three different functions and that non-pale one still has an unencumbered three hundred thousand dollar balance. So we might have an opportunity not to have to go to the full council to address this and allow an internal reallocation through the financial resources budget. So could this committee Give that authorization. I would go ahead and continue with your motion uh, that's already passed. Have it move it through to the finance committee, and in the meantime, I'll get with the controller's office and uh, verify what I just said is possible. We can, we can let it let it uh, go with finance if, if that's appropriate. Okay. Dr. Cobb, I wanted to echo uh, Councilor Hoskin and, and Jordan. I think my question was mostly answered by Council, Councilman Baker's question. Um, was about professional schools, postgraduate, um, because I I remember when when I went to uh, optometry school, the the scale of A's and B's automatically went to uh, 94 to 100 with an A, and you made an 85, you get a C, and so the question was answered. It's not a great point, but I was I was uh, I, how is it when you is it just if you apply for a postgraduate, you know, there, how do you decide? Um, I'm just confused. 
how you said there are different criteria, and I just didn't understand what how, how we decide on the. Let's say a, a, a person goes to law school. A person goes to law school. How do you? What is the criteria for keeping them in the system? Is there? Because I mean, I'm kind of new to this. Like a lot of people, I'm not sure how that that citizen keeps getting funded through law school. As just as long as they're in good standing with with their profession. Okay, so that is the criteria. Okay. Right. Ms. Jordan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the criteria <coughs> to get a graduate scholarship is determined by your ending undergraduate grade point. Initially, yeah. And then after that, maintaining a good standing in the professional and school. And what is that minimal grade point to get the scholarship initially? Initially? Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, their admission to the school. To the school. And the reason I ask that is because I know of people that have just a, a low grade point, but they just did outstanding on their LSAT. And that was their admission to law school was how outstanding they did on their, their graduate test. But their grade point wasn't that outstanding. And I would still hope that we could find a way to sponsor those young people. Because to get into law school, and I'm not sure about medical school, but to get into law school, they look at a variety of things, and the grade point's only one portion of it. Well, I would really like to see it changed because of the... Uh, uh, all of us probably had a little different attitude toward how important GPA was at uh, undergraduate level than when we decided to enter a professional school. So, so we're sort of sort of penalizing students for uh, not applying themselves perhaps uh, at the undergraduate level even though they're, they're LSAT or other admission type tests to professional schools would be far above normal. But as it stands now, if they are admitted to a graduate school, then the grade point is not the determining factor in getting the initial graduate school. No, the grade, the grade school is still a determining is still a determining factor on the waiting list. See, that's if we can get enough funds that we're not worried about that waiting list, then all of that will go out the <coughs> go by the wayside. And then let's say after they migrate from the waiting list to the scholarship. They're now a continuing graduate right. student. So the grade point, the initial grade point, is not the determining factor the next time. Is the initial there, grade point fades out of the way then. It's just continued satisfactory progress in the in their profession. And the grade point at that point is not a material factor. Just so they can stay in the door before it closes. Right. Okay. Mr. Hoskins? You mentioned Dr. Morton, Votech scholarships. I am also due to this. We're I'm, funding I'm, I'm, I I'm have sorry. a hearing. I said you mentioned Votech scholarships. I thought I heard, or I thought maybe Doug mentioned that. Does your department handle Votech scholarships? No, that would be uh, handled through uh, Diane Kelly's okay. department, through Career Services. Ms. Fulbright? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was under the impression that the people in graduate school once they got their initial scholarship, had to maintain a three-point grade point average in graduate school. No, it depends upon maintaining good standing in their in their graduate school, which would normally be three point. Mr. Soap. Uh, okay, I've got a uh, question, uh, Dr. Morgan. Uh, it, it appears that uh, we've allocated a hundred scholarships for the graduate. Um, spots because we said you said the philosophy was that we would focus on undergraduate studies funding first and so the, the, the cutoff point is 3.28 on the GPA so um, in, 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 your, in your opinion you know we're talking about adding approximately 50 more uh, scholarship awards and so the philosophy has been that we focus on the undergraduate which in theory, could drop the uh, qualifying GPA down to 3.26, let's say. Okay, 
you see, the GPA is a, is a floated figure. Right. So three point point two eight this year. Existence. It may be three point next year. Right. Because because the funding is yeah. gone. Right. Okay. So but but somebody set an initial target of a hundred graduate students. Right. That's why that was still at first. No. We don't have any target for numbers. Uh, on, any, on any of the categories. In other words, we fund the continuing students, mm -hmm. both undergraduate and graduate students first, right. those that qualify, then new undergraduate students, and then what money is left over goes to new graduate students. The continuing graduate students are already funded in the, uh, you know, with the continuing. So, so that would be so the, the new graduate students. The new, the new numbers are the ones that didn't get funded. Right. Okay. <coughs> no, so, those 47 graduate students are, are uh, part The of new ones didn't get funded. The, the old ones that were already on the, the hundred right. that were in the existing program were the first ones to get. Right. The they scholarship. were funded, funded along with the other pool. Ms. Fraley, did you have a? Not now. Oh, <laughs> so the back to in good standing. In good standing is defined by the school that they're in. Yes. Oh, okay. Finally, yeah. Mr. Bosser. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Dr. Martin. My question is, if you fund a freshman going to school and he drops out after six weeks, what happens to that funding? What so you lost it? it. We lost it. Total amount of funding. Uh, what about the tracking system of uh, kids that graduate? Do you have that on a database of who we funded, if they finished college courses? Yes. And, and the other question I've got is: uh, Is there a payback system through the Cherokee Nation and Forest Community Self work that they uh, do to perform once they get a scholarship? Yes. They're one hour, one hour for every hundred dollars they receive. Okay. Through uh, through a uh, non-profit. Uh, Agency or organization. The only thing that bothers me, and I wish we could do something about, uh, if you fund 100 kids at a freshman class and 100 or 50 of them drop out, you lost fifty thousand right. dollars. Is there have we looked at the, something to do with that, or can we cover those dollars? I know now you're saying they go to the college, so they're lost. That kind of upsets me that we lose that much money. Yeah, and, and it's it's a um, terrible problem. You know, the dropout, uh, our dropout rate is not too much in excess of the, of the regular dropout rate. The uh, regular dropout rate is about 45%. Could you, uh, at our next meeting, could you give us a uh, percentage of the dropout rate of what we funded versus the dropout? We'll work that out for you. Sure will. Mr. Harvin. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. To follow up on what Council Buzzard was talking about, the dropouts, we need to take a hard look at trying to get some of this money back. And uh, maybe it, these freshmen need a loan instead of a grant to start with. And, uh, I'm not sure how to work this out, but the uh, lawyer's giving them a thousand bucks to go down and drink a bunch of beer and drop out. Well, of I course, see, that thousand pay. bucks goes to the college. It doesn't go to the student. So, well, it's a thousand bucks gone. Yeah, but it's a thousand dollars gone for the bot. Uh, some way, we need to take advantage of our expertise and try to work out something that uh, they didn't really know they got to stay in school to get this money. And uh, also, uh, <coughs> We're trying to concentrate on under, undergrads. How many do we have that's not funded? You say we have 47 graduate students. How about <coughs> undergrads? How many are not funded? We funded all that had that had a complete application. Everybody's funded. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. We now, it, um, you will have also, and I'm sorry, I jumped in there. Also, uh, among your constituents, uh, most of the time you're going to be dealing with the grandparents or the parents of the student. Uh, we take a student through, we sail them right through the process. Uh, but we have very few students come to the office with the applications. It's usually the parent or the grandparent. 
And by the time that information is translated to the student from grandparent to parent, uh, we run into a lot of confusion. What we're working toward is to require the student to deal with us, especially those who are, who are adults. You know, one of my biggest problems, or one of our biggest problems last year was with graduate students, mother, and that graduate student was 31 years old. You know, uh, but I never saw the graduate student have yet to this day to see the graduate student. So if, if we can deal with the students, everything goes smoothly. It's the uh, parents and grandparents that, uh, that get confused on the issue. So most of your contacts are probably not going to be by students, but by parents and grandparents. But again, uh, whoever. You know, naturally, we want to provide you with all the information that that you will need to, uh, you know, to visit with your constituents <coughs> about it. And any time you need uh, additional information, you know, don't hesitate to contact uh, uh, me or as far as higher is concerned with uh, Nita Wilson, and uh, we'll get the information right back to you. I thank you. I am going to um, end the questioning right now. This is a new council. We have a lot of um, <laughs> things that we need to, to catch I up on. I appreciate that there are still questions, but if you would, we've still got three more items of business. We have or three more reports. We have new business that we anticipate will take some discussion. Sure. So for those of you who have further questions, I would suggest that you avail Dr. Morton of his offer to, uh, to make information available to you as you request. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Verna Thompson and Head Start. Good morning. Good morning. I'll be very brief. I know Dr. Morton gave you a profile of the Head Start program yesterday, and I will follow up on that by giving you just a, a sketch of the program and field any questions that you may have as a result. Of We did start school uh, this weekend. We have uh, five openings up here in the Children's Village. Otherwise, all of our positions are filled out and about. Welcome to the new members of the Tidal Council. I look forward to uh, our working relationship. Thank you. Any Thank you. questions? questions? Thank you. Uh, I wanted to thank you. We have new, a new phone system with new numbers. Okay. Uh, next we have JOM, Dr. Butler Allen. Is she here or not here? She is on sick leave. Okay. And uh, we're not the Okay. Uh, and uh, Sequoia High School, uh, Gina Stanley. Ms. Stanley is out today. Is out today as well. Okay. Is it uh, possible to ask a question about the JOM program? Yes. Um, Dr. Morton, we recently were advised that they had the new uh, online uh, budgetary process up and running, and I had the opportunity to utilize that. It seemed like it was uh, pretty efficient. Do you have a, a, any reports that determine how many applications have been approved and, and where that might position us over previous years that the system wasn't in use? Nothing other than uh, visiting with uh, Dr. Uh, Allen and said that the process was uh, was working well and uh, in fact working above their expectations. Okay. Okay. I'll ask her to have a full report on that for okay. our, our next meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next is old business, and there is none pending at this time. So we will move to new business and the amendment of our agenda to uh, discuss the suggestions for meeting schedules to, uh, with six committees with the consolidation of committees that was achieved earlier this morning. Or was, um, and uh, I will open the floor to discussion of the three um, suggestions that are um, on this paper that is in front of you. Mr. Cobb. Mm -hmm. Or Mr. Baker. Okay. Right. The, it's up to y'all. I don't, uh, I really don't have a preference. Uh, the, I don't know how many people 
I, I do know that if you have all the meetings on one day, it, it makes for a long day, and, and maybe you don't get get full full notes, especially early on when when you have questions and you're wanting to learn. But uh, but any of these schedules would be fine. Uh, Mr. Cobb, I. Uh, there's been some talk about gas prices and some of those things, and, and uh, for, uh, for those of us that, that are over an hour from Tahlequah, and that is a uh, definite consideration, but I am of the opinion that um, when I'm here, I'm here to work, and uh, um, I've been entrusted to work for the Cherokee citizenry, and uh, I'm, I'm in favor of if I'm here, I'm going to work, and let's let's get it, get it finished and do what's right. So, thank you, Mr. Baker. Yes. May I, with the chair's permission, I'd like to ask Doug Evans some questions on executive finance. Would there be a problem with the budget mods to have the meeting earlier in the month, such as the day after the council meeting, when it's a full month till the next council meeting? Or would it be preferable to have it at the end of the month like we've been doing now? Well, the uh, the original m m movement of the Finance Committee to the end of the month was derived by the timing of the interim financial statement closing by the accounting department. Um, since that decision was made, the accounting department has began lagging a month on top of that. For instance, if we have a like the August 30th Executive and Finance Committee, we will receive financial statements not for July, but for June. So now we're like almost two months old with our interim financial statements. If you move it up, I, I believe they can, I, I don't want to speak for Cali, but I would hope they would be able to interimly close our books within five weeks uh, of, the, of the period. The budget mod, uh, how that's impacted by this <coughs> schedule is a little different. The grant money that comes in is not um, held up by our internal modification processes. It becomes available for the, uh, uh, the receiver of that grant in, uh, immediately upon receipt. The internal uh, discretionary funds, the general fund, motor fuels, things of that nature, those funds would be impacted by a movement of the Finance Committee. If we moved it up to the day after, then I, I would recommend we shorten the 10-day rule. Because if we don't, we're going from the last Thursday of a month to typically the second Tuesday. So we're, we're, we're bringing forward two weeks. We're taking two weeks out of their uh, tribal discretionary budget process. We'd be cutting two weeks out of that. Um, and, uh, and I typically can turn around and mod in a couple of days. So if you want to, uh, if you do choose to move these meetings, I would be willing to uh, recommend that, that uh, cut that 10-day requirement off of them, cut it down to maybe five days, I'll turn it around within two and, and still enable the finance body to review this before you come in and have to uh, consider it. But that would, that's the impact I see, Mr. Baker, on, on moving this to the second, or the, the day after the full council. But well, we would not have the full 10 days to review the budget mod. We would only no, have sir. Two to, two to three days if we get it electronically. Would, you could continue keeping the 10-day rule and, and continue to have, you know, my, they give it to us in 10 days. So I don't have any days there. <laughs> I just have to get it turned around as quick as possible and get it out in your hands. And hopefully that's at the eight or seven day mark. And typically I can do that. So if you keep the 10 day rule, it's a full two weeks is what we're taking out of their budget process. And the finance committee often, as, you, as you're aware of, considers um, mods to the mod, riders to the mod in the finance committee for things that come up of discretionary nature that are very timely, then there's nothing to say that the body can't go ahead and consider, you know, and hopefully we just don't have a lot of exceptions coming in and a lot of things, you know, adding to the mod in that, uh, by that two-week process. But 
Which would have to be done in full council. Yes, sir. Rather than in. Or you could add it, yeah, add it in the finance committee to the mod right there. It's just no one would have any opportunity to review it beforehand. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. That's clear. Mr. Thornton? I think they answered the question. Okay. Uh, I, was, I was worried about what would come forward between the uh, council meeting and the end of the month because we've had several departments bring different uh, uh, months forward and uh, wanting a grant or a matching grant or something of that nature had to be turned in before the council meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, I haven't done EMF meeting towards the end of the month, but it doesn't matter. I have a question to the to the council. As this was put together, are the uh, suggestions of the meeting times for each committee is that um, something that you had envisioned as being sort of firm, or were you just putting committees? I, I don't know how this paper was developed, so or by whom. So, uh, were these just suggestions of meeting times? This, this is not necessarily the meeting times that you were for the specific committee. No, Gail just brought up a good point. Like health committee. Yeah, uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mr. Cousins and Mr. McLemore, that it may be a little difficult for them to get here at nine o'clock. Right. Yeah. And they may not be awake yet. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be something to consider. Okay. Is there further discussion? Uh, Ms. Cowan, thoughts? Um, I don't know if this is the will of the body, but I'm still unsure, really, if I'm comfortable with shortening that time frame. Maybe we should move this to rules for consideration at the regular, what we've already got scheduled for the month. Give us time, more time to deliberate and ask questions and think it through, and then maybe decide going forward from there. So we have a motion to table. Motion, motion to table. And seconded. Move to rules in the month. Okay. So moved and seconded. Uh, do we need discussion on that or? Okay. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? It carries. We move this to rules. And um, that's it. Are there announcements at this time, Ms. Kelly? Folks, I just wanted to uh, bring to your attention, there's some stationery on your desk that the uh, Bokehead students put together. They made this. They didn't have it ready yesterday. So we gave it to you yesterday, but uh, it's going to be on your desk. And then the adult and literacy staff have uh, sent you a couple of So I just wanted to tell you that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Other announcements? This meeting? Moved to adjourn. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> it is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> that will be